Thank you for joining us for this Charleston virtual session where we'll be focusing on open access in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, the session we're calling Lifting Up Humanities and Social Sciences Researchers Through Library Stakeholder Cooperation on Open Research. Uh, I'm Emily Farrell. Uh, I'm the Global Commercial Director for Open Research at Taylor and Francis. And I'm joined by Erin Pollard, Project Officer for ERIC and the What Works Clearinghouse at the Institute of Education Sciences, and Jeff Carroll, Assistant Vice President for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Rutgers University Libraries. I'm going to start off by giving the publisher perspective, then Erin will speak from the Department of Education agency position, and Jeff will bring in the work that's being done from the library perspective at, uh, at Rutgers on open and public access. So for us as a publisher, a question that frequently comes up, particularly as a publisher that has a strong focus in humanities and social sciences, is what are the particular current challenges and opportunities for humanities and social sciences researchers? Um, and in trying to understand and answer that question, and um, it's, it's always clear to us as a publisher that we can't really make change or answer these questions alone, um, particularly when it comes to pathways for open access and increasing open research practices. Um, and for Taylor and Francis, as you can see, we do have strong publications and work very closely with a lot of researchers in the social sciences and humanities. Um, just on our journal side alone, we have over 1500 journals, um, but you'll also see that only 40 of those are fully open access. So to some degree that points a little bit to some of the challenges that we face in, in serving uh, that greater accessibility for humanities and so social sciences research. Um, though 98% of our journals do uh, offer an open access option. On the other hand, we've also seen the policy uh, landscape evolve uh, quite dramatically in the last few years from the upcoming change with the UKRI policy that is focusing on, on academic books, which of course will impact um, researchers that publish long form works. So a lot of humanities and social sciences researchers. Um, we've also been, been seeing you know, more data sharing discussions in the humanities and certainly qualitative social sciences. Um, and and more grappling with the the impact of open access in the humanities and social sciences. Um, we've seen SDM as an industry body um, develop a, a humanities focused subgroup. So a lot of people um, looking at you know policy and guideline development and and responding to to this need for for you know bringing the humanities and social sciences research ecosystem. Um, alongside the, the STEM side where there has been a faster move to open access. On the other side, we've also seen, um, you know, we've been looking at, at researcher attitudes. So for instance, um, the TNF strategy team did a survey this year looking at the differences in uh, attitudes towards open research um, across different types of researchers split between STM and HSS focused researchers and also across the stages of their careers. So you can see um, just briefly here how that differs by career stage and by discipline, um, but also that while a lot of early career researchers in, in all disciplines believe that that work should be open access. Um, there are different attitudes when it comes to things like um, impact uh, in tenure. So you can see in the middle here that, that humanities and social sciences researchers are more concerned that, um, that there really isn't that kind of sort of impact for their careers or for their research. Um, so, so there is a real mix still in, in beliefs and understandings um, in terms of engagement with, with open access and pathways. Um, from the work that we do with, with researchers on the editorial side, looking at the policy landscape uh, and, and looking about looking at sort of the ways that we believe that, that research should be more open, um, we, we also are certain that we need diverse ways of addressing these challenges. Um, so I'm going to just quickly talk about some of the models that we've started using, but also some of the ways that we work with researchers um, 
first of all, we've been really thrilled to launch this year a collective funding model for books. Um, these have been um, become more common. We've sort of seen a lot of innovation on the university press side with collective books models. Um, TNF's model will start opening books next year through the support of, of uh, libraries that we're in the midst of gathering together. Um, we're focusing on splitting that into collections, focusing on topics that are aligned with the UN sustainability goals. So things like women's health and rights, um, populism and extremism. We've also made sure to, to introduce um, tiering such that, that smaller institutions can reach the, the pricing. And we're piloting it for a year because we also believe, and as we develop this in cooperation with JISC and with feedback from the JISC consortium, we really do want to hear back from libraries and, and other stakeholders to make sure we're certain that the that the model is doing what it should and to help it evolve through that collaboration. Not just in, in terms of business models, but beyond that, in terms of supporting the full research life cycle. So looking at, at how we work together with researchers on supporting data sharing and even, in fact, understanding what data might be for, for researchers in, in humanities and social sciences where it's not always uh, where it's not always clear. Um, so we we work with, with researchers. We have we've developed a, a we make sure that we have data availability statements and we've also developed the route and launched the Routledge open research platform, which uses the F1000 um, open research model, uh, which has a social sciences and humanities directed data sharing policy and allows for non-traditional formats, um, non-traditional articles to be published. So researchers in the digital humanities, for instance, can publish um, you know, different sorts of method notes or, or data notes that might um, be able to sort of capture a larger part of their research output beyond just what might be sort of a traditional research article. Of course, we also have, uh, we will also work with libraries on transformative agreements. And while there has been discussion of the, the concerns around equity with APC models, we do see that there is an importance of transformative agreements in this ecosystem. They have been extremely successful in accelerating publishing open open access in humanities and social sciences disciplines. So you can see that uh, of the articles um, made of open access under transformative agreements with TNF in 2000, from 2018 to 22, 72% um, of those are in humanities and social sciences journals. And, and we've seen that um, areas where previously there had been no publishing in open access um, have a, a dramatically increased uptake. Um, we've this year was the third year of our agreement with JISC, and um, we've we've really seen that that significantly. So um, uh, the uptake of humanities and social sciences open access publishing under this agreement has been quite dramatic, and you can see it just here in the in this this visualization alone. Um, and not only that, but we've also seen the sorts of impacts that open access um, we hope to see with open access, which is increased citations, but also increased mentions in in policy documents and in news media. Um, one example from from this year, we had a uh, researcher Tess Howard, who was looking at um, girls dropping out of sports at high rates because they felt uncomfortable. Uh, wearing the regulation uniforms that they had to wear. They were um, feeling they were sexualized in the ways that they were forced to, to dress. And that's already having an impact on changing regulations for, for uniforms in some sports such that it will um, contribute to, to girls feeling more comfortable in the, the uniforms they're wearing and, and hopefully lead to more um, you know, retention of great athletes in, in sports. Beyond um, beyond the the research data, research outputs, on our editorial side, we're also working closely um, in the humanities on public engagement as a broader view to impact. So how do we work with, with humanities researchers on engaging with the communities, making that research visible and impactful and useful for the researchers that they're that they're working with? Because um, Talking about things just in the context of open or open access is is 
doesn't doesn't really engage these sorts of humanities researchers as much as looking at what is it what does it do for public engagement and and how how much of an impact is there in that regard of course impact means different things to different people um but i think in terms of you know one definition that we look to the the uk uh Research Excellence Framework talks about it as an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment or quality of life beyond academia. Um, I think that we're we're starting to see that with, with the research that's being made open under this diverse set of models. Um, so we're seeing the impact in academic citations, but beyond that with public engagement and um, engagement with global policy. So I think the sort of final point to say is that um, in order to, to continue to advance this, this transition to open access, particularly for humanities and social sciences, we really do need to work in collaboration with, with our library partners, with funders, understanding mandates and working to, together to, to support and put researchers in the centre. Um, to serve their needs through this work, I think is incredibly important. And we're seeing that where we're doing that, it's having an effect. Um, and we also need to think beyond just traditional articles. We need to think about how we support data sharing and discovery and the different sorts of venues that we're providing for researchers to make their work more available across the research life cycle. And although transformative agreements do get a lot of, a lot of, uh, attention um we we do believe that we need a variety of models to support this transition um to to get us to a more open ecosystem for humanities and social sciences researchers if you have an interest in having a look at the white paper that i referenced a little uh for that we worked on with JISC this year um you can grab that there and we, you can also find some of the work that our editorial teams have been doing on publicly engaged humanities if you follow the link there grab that link and now that's enough from me i'm going to pass it over to erin thanks Emily. um so i am erin pollard and i am the project officer for eric and the Montworks clearing house which are part of the institution of education institute of education sciences um and we are the um, nonpartisan research arm of the u.s department of education go to our next slide um what is IES? So IES is comprised of four centers. Um, the one that most of you, or many of you probably have heard of is the National Center of Education Statistics, um, which does all the big surveys, the nation's report card. But we also have um, the National Center for Education Research and the National Center for Special Education Research. And those centers fund grants in the field that produce a large volume of research. And then we have NCEE, which is the National Center of Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance. And we are comprised of many programs such as ERIC, the What Works Clearinghouse, the Regional Educational Laboratories, the National Library of Education, um, and the, the big national evaluations of federally funded programs. And what we are focused on is catalyzing um, evidence into action um, and taking existing evidence and really getting it into the field. So if you look at our mission and our priorities, a big thing that we're looking at is how do we get research into the field to really help um, provide scientific evidence to which ground education, practice, and policy, and then share this information broadly. So if we go to the next slide, I talk about large, how large? Funding varies um, in Congress, but we typically get about $375 million annually to the field for research. Um, this is not part of, I mentioned National Center for Education Statistics, they have a separate budget, they're funded out of statistics. So this is the National Center for Education Evaluation um, and Regional Assistance, so my center, as well as the field initiated research. Um, and so the output of this is approximately a thousand pieces of research, PDFs a year. Um, not necessarily all of these are unique articles, but this is how they show up in ERIC, um, which we'll get to in a minute. We find approximately somewhere between 160 and 180 grants per year. And most of these grants are multi-year. So they're five or more year, typically five-year grants. Um, and then approximately 50 research contracts that are ongoing. And then these are multiple years, uh, multi-year grants, so many of them are five-year grant or five-year contracts. 
but the contracts are um, they're funded at different times. So we at any given time we have about 50 of them. Then if we go to our next slide, I'm going to be mentioning Eric a lot. And many of you are may be familiar with Eric, but if you aren't, Eric is a free online database of education research that was founded almost 60 years ago. Um, and it includes content from 1907 to today. Um, and today, today, what we index is a little over a thousand publishers um, from 41 countries. So it's a truly a global database of education research. Um, we currently index about 1,250 journals um, and about 725 non-journal sources. So this is a great literature from organizations, universities, school districts, school boards, um, think tanks. So the gray literature is a key portion of Eric's content. Uh, but today we're going to be mostly focusing on the journal literature. Um, and so when you think about what is in there, we have about 2 million citations of education research. Um, this number was accurate from when I put the slides together, but it will probably be changing very soon to be over that 2 million mark. Um, and so a little over half of our content is peer reviewed, and this includes the historic content. Today, it's about 80% of what we index today is peer reviewed. Um, and approximately a quarter of our collection has full text freely available with it, either immediately or after an embargo of the publisher's choosing. And today, this looks like about 40, about 30% of our content. So we're working to increase that amount. Um, this does not include what proportion of content is open access on the publisher's website. There are often a good chunk of our um, sources are open access on a publisher's website that we link to, but we ourselves don't have permission to display that full text. The next slide. So what is IES doing um, as part of the federal government, federal funders to promote public access? So back in 2013, John Holdren, who is the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, wrote a memo to agencies that said, if your expenditures are over $100 million in R&D a year, then your, um, the results coming from the research you fund must be publicly available. So if you go into the next slide, we're going to talk about what the actual implications of this was for us. Other agencies implement it differently, but for the Institute of Education Sciences, which grants the majority of funding, research and development funding for the Department of Ed, we said that awardees needed to submit, awardees are grantees and contractors, they need to submit um, a copy of their research article to ERIC. Or if you publish in one of 700 journals that has an agreement, the publisher would deposit it on your behalf. And so we make that citation publicly available immediately, um, immediately in ERIC time, sometimes it takes a few weeks to get up, and then we make that full text available 12 months after the official date of publication. Um, so that is how it is currently working. If we go to the next slide, I get to talk to you. Oh, okay. So how this is this is a flowchart, which may actually work a lot better to think through how this works. So if you're people have to be subject to the policy, and then most I would say a good chunk of our grantees, we are getting the publisher to deposit that article, but about Half to, about half will have to deposit in Eric itself. So then if we go to the next slide, um, we'll get to talk about these exciting changes that we have coming up. So last summer, um, Alondra Nelson, who was the deputy assistant to the president and deputy director for science and society. So she was performing the delegated duties of the director in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. She wrote a new memo to agents on public access. And this required federal agencies with research and development expenditures, so all federal, so any level of expenditures, to update their public access policies to require all, all peer-reviewed scholarly publications authored or co-authored by individuals or institutions resulting from federally funded research are made freely available and publicly accessible by default in an agency-designated repository without any embargo or delay after publication. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to talk about what this actually means, we think. Okay, so that work needs to be immediately available when the publisher releases it. So previously it was 12 months after publication, um, which happened, and now it is going to be immediate. Um, publications need to be machine readable, which is defined as XML or HTML, not PDF. Publications need to be made freely available and publicly available by default. So that means with an open license. 
um, and data from the study must be released at the same time as the publication. Now, this policy is set to go in place for grants starting in 2025. Um, so it is that we won't see the impact of this for a while um, because of the cycle of grants, but we're going to start be seeing some of these implications. So if we go to the next slide, um, here is how we are planning to implement this policy. And it's important to note that the, our plan, the Department of Education's plan and policy have not yet been released. We are still working on it, um, but this is where we're thinking now. So it is subject to change, but Eric is planning to create the XML for our awardees. Different um, sources will do different things. So right now, most of our public, many publishers are depositing journal articles on behalf of their grantees. Now we are going to be requiring grantees to give us the document to create the XML. Um, awardees are gonna be, so they're gonna be responsible for submitting their work um, to Eric. Uh, so it's gonna be shifting the burden a little bit to grantees. And we're also gonna be working with publishers to see if they would like to give us their XML at the time of release. We are not sure if that's gonna be possible or not. So that may happen in the future. Um, the other thing that we are thinking through is what is that cost sharing model going to be? Uh, IS currently pays, um, allows article processing charges to be refundable under the grant. And so we plan to continue that in the future, but we're also thinking through what are the other ways we can make this content freely available. Um, and so then if we go to the next slide, um, so this is kind of what I have. Um, and if you have any questions after this, uh, feel free to reach out to me at the slide, but we will be keeping you up to date as we are publishing more about this policy and thinking about how we're going to be bringing open access into um, the department. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I'm Jeff Carroll, the Assistant Vice President for Scholarly Communication and Collections at Rutgers University, the public university of the state of New Jersey. Um, Emily spoke about a publisher's perspective and Aaron was coming from a government agency perspective and I'll be coming wrapping it up from an academic library perspective. Next slide. <clears throat> and I'm not going to necessarily talk in this order, but I'm going to be covering the increases in library community engagement efforts, effects of the Rutgers University Senate OA policy and participation in open access agreements, um, mainly through the libraries, but how it benefits the rest of the university research community. Um, next slide. Um, so I'll start with the Rutgers University open access policy, because um, that sort of sets the basis for the rest of the ecosystem to develop. So in 2012, the Rutgers University Senate almost unanimously passed an open access policy university-wide. And then that policy went into effect September 1st, 2015. Um, jump ahead to this spring in 2023, a, uh, the Senate charged a subgroup to investigate development of a university-wide research information system to help build out support for what we're trying to do around open access and why. So next slide. So this is the policy. This is the policy itself. This is the policy itself. <laughs> Thanks, Eric, Emily. Um, and I won't read through the whole thing. I just want to highlight a few aspects of it. Um, we're going to talk about what the policy is intended to do, the reason for the policy, and to whom it applies. Now the next slide. So um, what it's intended to do, I think back in 2015, they were looking at an open access policy to increase the visibility, readership, and impact of Rutgers scholarship. That still applies today, um, but there's more to it. Um, next slide, please. And the reason for the policy was to promote open and free access to peer-reviewed literature, predominantly that from our perspective, what was produced at Rutgers, but um, within the rest of the ecosystem uh, across uh, research institutions. Next slide. And then the policy was to apply to all faculty um, and Rutgers graduate and postdoctoral students while they are employed by or enrolled at Rutgers. Next slide. 
<clears throat> to help support this, the libraries that established an institutional repository called SOAR, Scholarly Open Access at Rutgers, um, that could serve as a place to store the results of research occurring at Rutgers and share it openly with the world. Um, I don't know if this is too small to see, but it's interesting, not surprising, the, the biggest usage or downloads are coming from the United States, but second is India, third is China, and fourth is Singapore. So a lot of action over there in East Asia and South Asia. Um, and then scrolling to the bottom of the screen, next slide, um, we just have a little bit more metrics. We have 30,801 research outputs, almost half a million views, and three quarters of a million downloads. So that's since the policy went active in 2015 and SOAR was developed to, to take in and ingest some of these um, articles. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the Rutgers University Senate just this past spring charged a, sub, a subgroup to investigate development of a university-wide research information system. Um, next slide. The task force is made up of participants from just the libraries and the Office of Research. So the onus has been put on these two groups within the university to explore some of the um, opportunities that we have to build out the ecosystem in support of open access scholarship at Rutgers. Um, it's also an effort to ensure that we have the ecosystem infrastructure in place to facilitate compliance with both the university's OA policy as well as the recommendations made by the Nelson memo uh, that Aaron talked about. Next slide. This is somewhat intentionally too small to see, but um, one thing that the, the, the libraries at Rutgers have developed in order to help point researchers to the right direction and also underscores some of the open access agreements that we've been able to negotiate with publishers um, we point our researchers to this page. It's where we list all of the agreements, um, transformative and read and publish agreements that we've got in place so far. It's got the title of each agreement, a little blurb about what the agreement covers, and then the link to the agreement itself on the publisher's website that in most cases walks the researcher through the publication um, um, submission process. Um, hopefully, this page will continue to grow, and in fact, I expect it to expand quite a bit in 2024. We can't talk about the specifics right now because it's still in negotiation, but uh, we'll look at a few numbers in a, in a moment or two. Uh, next slide. And it goes beyond just the read and publish agreements and uh, transformative agreements. So I also want to point out some of the things that um, Rutgers is a member of the BTAA and the BTAA is actively involved in supporting a number of open access initiatives. Some of these do overlap with our read and publish agreements, um, Cambridge University Press, FOSS, and Wiley, for example. But we have others that we're supporting their open access efforts in general, and these are just a few of those that we've supported through um, the BTAA consortium. We don't yet have a list, Rutgers libraries don't yet have a list of the um, subscribe to open models that we've signed on to. Um, we need to get that because it's grow a growing list and I'd like to be able to quantify that. So that'll be in the next uh, few weeks or months that we'll try to pull that list together. Next slide. <clears throat> so some numbers behind what we've achieved so far and some projections for going forward. Now, this is just at Rutgers University, but since we put these read and publish agreements in place, um, we started in 2022, we had these numbers are estimates because I didn't count all of the articles published across all of the agreements. It's just including the biggest publishers, but it's a um, it's a very small percentage or very few numbers that we add across if we took all of the publishers. So these are estimates that are on the low side or very conservative. Um, and then there's a high degree of uncertainty as we get out in the later years. So we published 
103 articles open access through specifically through the agreements that we've negotiated in 2022. This year, we're on track to publish 264, so more than double 2022. And 2024, we anticipate doubling, almost doubling again, 533. And then at some point, tapering off and leveling out as we get, hopefully, most of the biggest publishers signed on. And then we start to uh, go after smaller publishers in that long tail of them. Um, I do expect, though, that these numbers are very conservative, so there will be a higher increase than what we're seeing here. It's also important for us not to just count the number of articles, but to try to estimate or quantify the amount of savings or the value that we're bringing to our researchers um, as we show what kind of support we're providing for this. So next slide. Um, and this is where um, we're getting some visibility from some of the departments, chancellor-led units, uh, 2022. And, and what we're calling savings and APCs is a broad estimation. It's theoretical. In many cases, the researcher probably, not all of the researchers would have paid an APC. They would have probably just gone the standard publication model and then relied on 3OA deposit into our institutional repositories to satisfy the university's open access policy. But um, in trying to transform everyone getting on board to publish open access from the get-go, um, that's how we're trying to pitch the, the savings and APCs here. So 2022, we were uh, about $350,000, 2023 approaching Seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. Twenty twenty four, we think will be about a million and a half, and then we start to uh, plateau just above two million, trying to get up to two and a half million on those out years to twenty twenty eight. Again, I think these are conservative estimates, especially as we go out. I'm hoping that they will be higher, um, but it's uh, an interesting quantification of the value that I think our effort to are showing across the university. So um, the next slide. Um, these agreements, I just wanted to point out the value proposition also in those APC savings is right now the libraries are not getting additional funds to go into these agreements. So some of the uh, parameters that make a, an agreement successful or the negotiation successful is number one, it has to be cost neutral. Um, or pretty close to what we were paying in the subscription as we transition to read and publish. Um, and as we ramp up, we have so few staff involved in managing these read and publish agreements that we'd like um, the publisher to do most of the work in verifying um, author affiliation and to make it as much of an automated process as possible. We're more, we're less concerned about non-affiliates actually taking advantage of the of the opportunity and then we'll review the results after the fact and if we see things are there are too many people taking advantage of it that shouldn't be we can make we can tweak the system to try to tighten up on it. Um, so far um, it's been really good and I don't really see people outside of Rutgers being able to take advantage of it. Um, next slide. And uh, that's all I have. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, uh, for those of you who have an opportunity to take the time to, to see this presentation, we'll field questions at that point. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for everyone listening. And um, we'll switch now to, I think, a live Q&A for a few minutes to answer any questions. Thanks so much.